Welcome to the Thursday night Flo Feldman Price class, streaming live out of Jefferson Farm Kitchen. And we're going to switch it up a little bit. I think I'm going to start recording using the iPhone and the Mac mic because the sound quality on Zoom is either diminished or it just isn't very good. And uh, for people to do these from home, I think it makes a big difference if it sounds pretty good. So today, we're going to piggyback on what we did last week, which was a lesson in sitting. But there won't be any sitting in this lesson. But what intrigued me was I was driving around, and I started to remember this connection between sitting and driving and how um, if you're using your whole self in an effective way, it's pretty effortless to lift up your foot and put it on the gas pedal or the brake. But if you have somehow fallen into habits that are not real functional in sitting, number one, the lesson that we did last week would be a lot of work. But number two, there's no sense of activation of the pelvis when you lift your foot when you're driving. So that's kind of what reminded me of this topic. But I thought we'd approach it from the floor. So let's start with our typical body scan and just lie on the floor and notice if you're uncomfortable lying flat. Notice if your back is up off the floor even when you're not trying to be upright. Again, standing against the field of gravity. And take a few breaths. And as you breathe, just pause after the exhale to notice at what point do you begin to breathe spontaneously so that you start to trust your nervous system. So one of the things we're working with here is like what is good posture? So just put that question in the back of your mind while we start moving so that you're not lying still for too long. But this is a, sort of an underlying question we're thinking about today. Notice how your shoulders are contacting the floor and how much of your shoulder is contacting the floor on the right compared to the left. And notice if you feel more pressure under one side of your pelvis than the other. And then when you're ready, go ahead and bend both knees and stand your feet so that your knees are over your feet. And just lift your left knee and foot up off the ground and then set it down. And notice how much work is it and how much does it displace your pelvis when you lift your leg, your left knee and foot off the floor. You notice that it displaces your pelvis to one side. Maybe you feel more pressure under the other side of your pelvis. So that kind of begs the question, what are ground forces? Like ground forces feel like more pressure underneath. So if you lift your leg again, do you notice that your pelvis moves from front to back at all? It probably doesn't. So just if measure, take a sort of a, a measurement of how much work it is, as if you could you know, create a felt image of that, just to lift the left leg. And then bring your hands together and Interlace your fingers and put them behind your head 
and just gently start to lift your head with your elbows coming forward to make it easier so you're using your arms to lift your head as if to look at your left knee and notice that you start to flex your neck to lift it forward and then rotate it a little bit to the left to look at your left knee and just notice how much work that is and rest for a moment this might feel kind of familiar so this is a little bit like the crunches that people do in gyms to get rid of abdominal weight, right? But it's very different because we're more interested in how we organize ourselves to do things so that it's light and easy. So when you're ready, bend your, or bring your elbows forward and lift your head again. And this time, as you take your right elbow towards your left knee, bring your left knee over your torso so that you're bringing them in the direction of each other and then set them down at the same time. And do this many times and see if you can find a way to make it easier so that the right elbow is in the direction of the left knee as the left knee comes over the torso and that the movement is somehow synchronized so that it's of the same velocity and the same size on both ends of you. And maybe just notice if you use your eyes in any way. Do you have your eyes open? Do you have your eyes closed? Is it easier if you take your eyes in the direction that you're moving in? What do you do with your breath? And then let it go and rest. And just notice in resting, uh, let your arms and legs go long for a minute so it's a complete rest. And when you're, when you're resting, think about, you know, were you holding your breath or were you synchronizing your exhale in a specific part of the movement? So considering the human structure, the pelvis is really the foundation when we're standing for everything. It carries the weight of the internal organs in the abdomen. And then the spine rests on the pelvis. So if the pelvis is like stiff or if it's disorganized in some way, it makes it really hard to carry the head. And all the the weight of the ribs actually depends or hangs from the skeleton and the arms as well. And if you think about the muscles of the arms, if you want to raise your arms, you'd have to have one muscle that's above the arm and one that's below it. And if, if the ribs are stiff, then that also makes it harder to move the arms. So everything kind of hangs off of the skeleton, except for the head, which hopefully is balanced above it in a way. But what we're playing with here is creating freedom of motion and awareness in the pelvis because it's the foundation that allows for freedom of motion in, in the head and neck. So when you're ready, just test out how, if anything's changed, by bending your knees and standing your feet. And then just uh, try lifting the left knee over the torso again. And notice that, yeah, it's actually a little bit easier if you bring it further over your torso than if you just lift it a few inches off the floor the way we did at the beginning. So at the beginning, I just said, you know, pick up your foot and notice that for some reason, it's easier if you bring your knee past the vertical and over your belly. Because that, at that point, the law of gravity comes into play. Now, you don't have to necessarily rotate towards the midline. But what if you take your, your knee over your torso just in the same way that you did when you were bringing your elbow towards it? 
And notice, really, that what's important is more, are you still feeling like you're lifting your leg in the way you did at the beginning, where it was just the leg lifting and there was an increase of pressure underneath the right side of the pelvis? Or could you pause and go back to lifting your head and bringing your elbow towards your knee? So you've got the hands clasped behind your head and then only go as far as you can go easily, bringing the right elbow towards the left knee. So notice that it's actually more work to just lift your head than it is to lift your head and lift your knee. See if you can distinguish that. It's easier to make a global movement because somehow it activates something in your core so that you're using more of yourself. See if you can find a way to distinguish the difference. So see if you could lift your knee and your elbow in, in sort of like one fell swoop, you know, so that, so that it feels like you can feel your back flattening against the floor. Maybe you start to use your breath in a specific way such that you exhale when you bring the knee towards the elbow and the elbow towards the knee. And notice if you typically have your eyes closed, what happens if you open your eyes and look down in the direction that you're going in? Does that seem to somehow make it easier? And then let that go, and just uh, rest for a moment. So let's go to visit the, the way that the eyes govern how the muscles of the neck move, just to clarify what is easier in your own experience. Because it doesn't really matter what I say. Theory is not important. What matters is your, what you're able to feel and do you know, in, in life, right? It's the results that we get when we go out in the world that really affect the quality of our lives, not the ideas that we have about them. So just turn your head to look to the left a few times and open your eyes and look to the left and mark a spot on the wall there to your left that you're looking at and then bring your head back to center. So let your eyes Look at the ceiling, which is the neutral point. Turn your head to the left and look to the left. And notice that the sensation of rotation in your neck is kind of, it's usually it's pretty smooth if you follow your eyes, right? So then if the next time your eyes are on the ceiling, leave your eyes on the ceiling and turn your head to the left and make it a small movement, just enough to know that you're doing it. And notice that it's, it's like it increases the degree of complexity and maybe it has a sensation of being a little bit bumpy somehow. Like there's a feeling of bump, 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 like stops on a train or something. When you keep your eyes going effectively, they're going in the opposite direction of the movement. And then pause and then take your eyes with you and notice if it's easier to make your eyes follow a level line on what would be the horizon if you were upright as you turn to look to the left and take your head to the left. And just notice the quality of the movement. Is it smoother in the back of your neck? Is there a sensation that's different on the right side of your back versus the left side of your back. So just noticing if there is a difference in the quality of the side that you've paid attention to. Is it possible that awareness itself not just awareness as some abstract idea, but the 
the act of paying attention to your sensations as you move could create a different sense of quality in the left side of your neck versus the muscles on the right side of your neck. Not that you would bring this level of attention to everything you do, but when you're, when you're learning something or when you're learning to deconstruct habits just to see if they work for you, it's sort of a temporary phase that you can go through to improve the quality of how you move. And what that means is that it, it's an organization that looks smooth and easy from the outside, like the elite athlete or the dancer or the golfer, right? It just looks effortless when they move because they're well organized. Or maybe you've worked in a kitchen with other people and when the people are well organized, not just in their own movements, but within their relationship with each other, it's like a dance and they somehow know where the other person is and when they turn or when they're behind the other person, I mean, they just somehow magically move around each other in space because there's more to our ability to know where we are in space than we're really conscious of. So when you're ready, I'll just take another little break and then just bend your knees and try lifting that left leg over your torso again and see if you can make it lighter and easier so that you're not feeling a huge displacement in your pelvis and you're not feeling any so so you're not aiming to go or over the vertical like there's a midline of your body don't you're not crossing the midline of your body you're just bringing your knee over your torso the same way you did before when you were lifting your head and then if you lift the right leg notice if it's heavier because you haven't tried to organize it in this way notice if it feels somehow yeah, less, it's less easy to use your pelvis on that side because we haven't quite awakened that consciousness there. And then you could try lifting the right and the left lightly, one, two, one, two, one, two, just to see if you can get yourself to feel, a, make it lighter so that you could lift your leg. You can make it kind of quite quick just for a moment just to see if, how light you can make it. So just lift one leg, one foot, one foot, one foot, and the other foot, and boom, 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 make it quick and light. That's it. And interesting, there's much more rotation going on there, but it's not because you're trying to turn, it's because the law of gravity has having its way with you. <laughs> so let that go and rest for a moment. So we don't have to learn how to use the law of gravity, right? It's not like you uh, stand on top of a building and, and jump off to see if it works when you're a little kid, although some kids have done that, but <laughs> um, it's pretty clear. I mean, most kids get it because they play with balls and they play with things and they throw things and they fall, you know, the things fall. And so it's like this, this thing that we're constantly subjected to that we don't really think about, but this is about how to learn to use it to your advantage. So just to go back to this idea of what is posture that's potent, like posture that um, has the ability to adapt in any situation. So Feldenkrais, who I think got some of these ideas from his experience as a judo black belt, had the sense that good posture is the ability to move through a neutral space, a neutral point in balance, and turn in any direction at any time spontaneously if you needed to, with ease, without any effort. So his definition of Posture, he, he didn't like the word posture because it implies a statue, like a Greek statue is in a posture. But people are never really that still. So he sort of coined this word actor to mean that it's dynamic. And so the four 
things that he said are required for good posture are visible ease, such as that when you see somebody move who's really skilled at what they're doing, even from a distance, the untrained eye can see that it looks graceful and easy. Uh, number two is the absence of parasitic movement or conflicting impulses. So parasitic movement meaning any effort that you're exerting that's counteractive or counterproductive to what your intention is. Like um, sometimes people put a lot of effort into their jaw when they're not sure if they can do something. They might grit their teeth or put their tongue out or something. So notice if there's any holding or bracing in the, in the jaw. And if it's not a part of the movement request, see if you can inhibit that. Because the measure of skillful, mature organization is the ability to inhibit unwanted things that we're doing compulsive things. And I think if you think about how sometimes teenagers behave, it makes it more clear. <laughs> they, they do a lot of things compulsively without really realizing that they're not thinking it through. The third thing is reversibility. Can you do something in two directions in a way that's synchronized? And then the fourth thing is ease of breathing. Is your breath independent of what you're doing? So when you're ready, bend your knees and stand your feet. And just to illustrate the point that we have habits about things we're not even aware of, interlace your fingers. And then notice, just look and see what, which thumb is on top, which finger is on top. And then take your hands apart and interlace them in the non-habitual way. And notice that it feels a little bit awkward because it's not your habit. And then put that behind your head. Um, and this time, just touch base with lifting the head and taking the right elbow towards the left knee. And so when and taking the left knee towards the right elbow. So make it a global movement that, there you go. And then leave the knee on the floor and one more time, lift your head with your elbows coming forward and then turn your head so that your left elbow comes towards the floor Turn your head to look to the left. That's it. So you're sort of going up in the air and then rotating. And try that a couple times. You're basically just turning your head with your whole shoulder girdle on each side coming with you so that your left arm comes closer to the floor. Doesn't necessarily touch it. But notice that there are different ways you could do this. So we're playing here with, last week we talked a lot about planes of motion. So if you're just rotating, then your upper body is just rotating around the axis of your spine to the left. And then the next time you do that, what happens if you, when you get so that your left elbow is close to the floor, what happens if you turn to sort of stay in that same position so that you're rotated to the left, but you look up towards the wall above your head you're adding, first you do rotation, and then slide your elbow in an arc around you towards the top, towards the wall above your head. That's it, as if you were looking up to the left above you. And notice if you can distinguish and differentiate these different planes of motion. So you've got like a rotation going on, and then you're going into an extension. And this really requires your ribs to soften because if they are, yeah, let it go, rest, take a long rest, full rest. And take another deep breath or two and just notice if there's more mobility on the ribs on the left side, if they maybe feel softer.
So there's a third, actually a fifth piece that uh, in the book, The Potent Self, um, Dr. Feldenkrais talks about, and that is really the, the ability to adapt and to be resilient and to be potent in your ability to move through life has something to do with an absence of emotional association with movements. So let's say somebody sends you an email where they are accusing you or implying something about that you didn't do and you know you did it and you immediately have this inner response, right? You have an emotional response and there's this compulsion to immediately zap something back, right? So that's kind of what we're talking about. It's a similar kind of a thing. So um, so I'm just putting it out there as something to chew on and to think about. Is there, when you feel that you're compulsively reacting, that you're triggered in some way, do you notice throughout your own life, you know, when you're out there in the world, do you notice that there is a certain muscular contraction, a certain, um, like, frustration and anger create shortening of the muscles? Those would be considered parasitic efforts that are not conducive to anybody's best um, intention. So when you're ready, if you would, bend your knees and stand your feet and put your hands behind your head in the same way. And then this time, uh, just, just lift the right leg a few times. And notice how you organize yourself to do that. Notice how you feel the shift in the displacement of the pelvis and where the weight goes underneath. You know, is there an increase in pressure anywhere underneath you? Is it a little bit easier to do it since you've tried it on the other side? Notice it's different if you stabilize your core somehow. And then at some point when you're ready, start lifting your head and with your arms and your elbows so that you begin to take your left elbow towards your right knee. And then set your foot down and your head down at the same time. And if there's something that's not comfortable, make it smaller. Something happened right in here. But I can just like this little shrug hand. It's fine. So see if you can lift from some other part of your spine or just make it smaller. So there's, those are, you know, like if there's discomfort in a specific area, it's either chronically short, in which case you really should just do less or it's chronically overused, in, or both, but in which case it helps to just see if you can flex from some other part of your ribs, or see if you open your eyes and look in the direction either of your knee or a little bit to the right. What's easier? So it's kind of... A, Every lesson is an opportunity for you to figure out what's the easiest way to do this, given the constraints that I live with every day, given my habits, given the history of aches and pains that I've had and the kind of work that I do. And then just let it go, let your arms and legs go long. So here's another variation. Try this piece. So uh, when you're ready, come again. Bring your 
feet to standing and I'll just just try lifting the right leg and see if you can make it a more global effortless movement than you did at first. Yeah, I think I think um, it's fine to bring it around to the side. I think if you cross the midline, that creates a different dynamic neurologically. So just for the for the purposes of the lesson. And notice if you're sort of bracing to lift the leg or if it's if you're incorporating your breath and your exhale. So actually let's be more deliberate and more clear about that. So take a breath in and as you exhale, could you bring your knee over your torso and just notice if it's a little bit easier. Last week we did a bunch of stuff with exhaling after the exhale to really bring the lower abdominals into play and just see if that helps, see if that makes it easier. So again, in, you know, in the course of a lesson, we do these things that are kind of seem artificial that you wouldn't normally do, but it's in the service of, like the nervous system will pick up on what's easier and it will stick so that it shifts how, you, how your reflexes respond when you're not even thinking about it. So while we, you know, learning is a process of making things conscious and explicit until they become so easy that you can do them without really thinking about it and then they go into the realm of unconscious habit. So it might actually be easier if you just try doing both legs at the same time. So let's try that too. So just rest for a moment. It's easier to organize a regrouping if you pause and clear the slate. And then when you're ready, bend your knees, stand your feet, and try just lifting both knees over your torso and see if you can find an easy way, a light way to do it. And if it is, in fact, easier, there's not all this displacement that you have to fight when you take both knees over your torso. And notice how your head moves, because at this point, your pelvis is actively connecting through your spine into your head. And you can feel that your chin gets a little bit further away from your chest as your knees come up towards your pelvis. So here's a, there's so many ways to do one thing. This is what people are not really aware of, right? So notice if, as you lift your knees over your torso, are you sort of pushing your belly out? And try doing that intentionally and notice if it's a little bit harder. So put your knees, your feet on the ground, and then just sort of hold your belly stiff somehow or push it out a little bit, either one, as you bring your knees over your torso and notice that it's, it's kind of a little bit harder. And so the opposite of that would be to inhale and then exhale before you lift your knees and then bring your knees over your torso as you exhale. And see if you can exhale all the way down to the very base of the pubic bone. Because this, these, it, that activates the muscles of the pelvic floor so they come into play, which is so important to the way that the pelvis is organized for stability so the rest of us has freedom of mobility. Okay, and then rest, maybe just rest with your feet on the ground. Sorry? Yeah, well, whatever, it's fine, doesn't matter. Whatever's more comfortable. Notice if anything's changed in the way your back is touching the floor. Okay. 
So another idea is uh, another variation. So, I mean, one of the ways that these lessons cultivate adaptability and resilience is it starts you thinking about what are the possibilities. It starts you thinking deliberately about like what's an outside of the box option that I haven't considered yet. So let's try this one. Bend your knees, stand your feet, and put your hands on the outside of your knees, so on the part of your knees that's underneath your kneecap in front on the top of your shins, so in front of your shins, there you go. And then as you take your knees away from yourself and your feet closer to the floor, notice that that helps lengthen your arms and because your arms are attached to your shoulders it takes your shoulders a little bit further away from your spine which is it looks like it was feeling a little bit cramped back there And notice when you take your knees away from yourself with your hands attached, does it, what could you do in your neck and jaw that would be soft? Like at, at what point when you take your knees further away from yourself, your shoulders maybe come up off the ground. If you let your, your jaw open and your head tilt back and you can look at the wall above your head, does that make it easier to lift your shoulders? So you're not holding your head and neck in a static position. You're just allowing the movement to move through you. When you take your knees away from yourself, is it easier if you soften your neck? And then when you bring your knees back closer to you, you can feel your neck getting closer to the floor. Just play with that for a moment. When's it easier to inhale? When's it easier to exhale? And let that go. So what we're playing here too is the, when I say organization, people don't really know what that means. So some of the muscles we use and we have voluntary contraction over them. And some of them are tonically contracted, meaning that some of them, some of the muscles are used for holding ourselves upright against gravity and we don't really have voluntary control over the contraction that they go into on a habitual basis. But by playing with movement slowly with awareness in this way, you can, the nervous system kind of recalibrates that for you. So try this um, piece. Lift, bend your knees and stand your feet and put your hands behind your head so that you're going to lift your head and take your your right knee in the direct I'm sorry your right elbow in the direction of your left knee and bringing the left knee over your torso and then act as if there was a stick between the knee and the elbow and and see if you can move forward and back as if the distance between the knee and the elbow remains exactly the same and see you know, how far apart do they need to be for it to be fairly comfortable, not a huge sense of exertion.
how do you synchronize the movement of the leg away from you so that it makes it easier to bring the elbow towards the knee. And then go back to the other thing where you're bringing the knee towards the elbow and the elbow towards the knee and just remember to use your eyes in whatever way makes it easier. Is it easier if you look to your to the side? And then let that go. So today I heard a strange story that I have no idea if it's true, but it was interesting. This yogi was talking about how uh, it's common knowledge in India that when people who've been meditating at the level of a yogi for many years, they'll go into the woods and meditate, and they have these cobras there that like to hang out with people who are meditating. And these are like the kind of cobras that have venomous... um, a bite and that apparently their venom is so strong that it could kill an elephant and it would kill a human within eight minutes. But for some reason he was claiming that they have no interest in biting you if you're in this kind of a calm state of no mind, no thought, of completely being present and relaxed and open to whatever reality is bringing which is a very different state than, say, actually, I know why this was interesting. I don't know what's going on with this, but I was in Staples the other day, and there's a big counter. It's like 12 feet across. On the other side of this counter, there was this woman, and she had this thing around her neck, and I thought it was just some kind of a stuffed animal. It it was brown. It was a brown snake-looking, like, scarf. And then, at some point, the thing started moving, and it caught my eye, and I said, oh my god, that thing's alive. (laughs) And uh, the woman who was working behind the counter retreated to the far corner and stayed there for the duration until the woman left. But the woman just ignored me, and um, she kind of looked at me in this weird way where it was like she was trying to intimidate me but ignore me at the same time. Uh, So I don't know what that was about, but um, yeah. Was it a snake? It was a snake. I'm sure it was a harmless snake, but um, it was around her neck. neck. And if the thing had gotten loose in the store, I'm sure, you know, it could have hidden anywhere. I mean, that's a huge store, right, with lots of little shelves, just crazy bizarre. But, but I felt the fear because I'm not crazy about snakes. And, and so what this yogi was saying is it's the fear that activates their, their venom. It's the fear that activates their desire to react, their desire to reach out and strike. And I'm sure that that's true in people too. It's, it's <laughs> somehow. <laughs> I know it's true of dogs probably true in horses and I've certainly spent a lot of time working with dogs and horses and I have no trouble inhibiting fear well I don't even feel fear anymore when I work with horses unless they're clearly insane which I don't hang out with that kind of a horse but uh, so uh, it's just an interesting exploration of the state that we're in and what we're bringing to the table and how that affects the reality that we're living and, and the, those around us. So this idea of being potent, potent actor, or pot, you know, like to hit for Feldenkrais, this, didn't just, this wasn't just about posture. It was about like um, how we can act in the world and do what we intend with a sense of potency and how we can learn to adapt to situations. And right now we're living in this bizarre situation where, 
you know, this is like nothing the world has ever known, and we're all being required to find new ways of acting. So it seems pretty relevant. It seems like the time for this, this sort of study of how can we learn to adapt and react in new ways is really important right now. So, at this point, turn and roll your head a little bit to the right and back to neutral. So we did the left side, so try the right side. And just notice the difference in the quality of sensation you feel on the two sides of your neck. And notice if you tend to habitually turn your head with your eyes closed and find that more soothing. Are you actually moving your eyes even though your eyes are closed? And then, you know, learning this method is really not about the individual lesson, but, but more about learning these strategies of engaging with your experience. So what could you do that's not your habit? Could you try something else, uh, a variation that accomplishes the same request, but is just different? So one might be just opening your eyes and turning and looking to the right as you open your eyes. Noticing if, if you were looking at the horizon, is it level or does it sort of, is it smooth, is it bumpy? The more refined your ability to notice what you're getting in response to what you do, the easier it is to change it and adapt and come up with a new idea. And then try this thing where you leave your eyes on the ceiling as you turn your head to the right and then Well, so if you feel like your eyes are moving in an arc, it maybe has something to do with the way that your head is touching the floor, right? Yeah. So if the top of your head is closer to the floor than, say, the middle of the back of your head, then it's going to be more of an arc. And so just as you would if you were doing an inventory, you know, don't judge, don't try to fix it or make it quote unquote better, just notice what you get and see if you can especially emphasize your noticing of what's easier, what's comfortable, and how can I create more of that. Like This is not the same value system as the school system that says, you know, you need to sit still and be quiet and look like you're working really hard, or not only look like it, but actually be working hard, right? And I'm not saying there's no value in working. I'm not saying there's no value in working, but hard, the hard part is what we need to think about. Like at what point do we work so hard that we stop learning or we stop enjoying? So what else didn't we try? Bend the knees and stand the feet and put the hands behind the head. And then just this clarification of these planes of motion. If you take the right elbow towards the left knee again and the left knee towards the elbow so that it's a global movement. Notice that it's easier if you turn to look a little bit to the left. That was the other side. So go, go to the other side. So take the left elbow to the right knee. That's it. And then notice that it's facilitated by looking a little bit to the right. And as you look a little bit to the right, each time you lift, could you bring the right side of your arm closer to the ground, so you're effectively rotating around your spine. And then 
What if you lift, leave both legs on the floor, both feet on the floor, and then lift and turn your upper body? And then when you get your right arm towards the floor, can you look up, sort of make an arc around yourself to look up towards the ceiling above, well, in this case, the wall is above your head because you're lying on the floor. So think rotation, and then when you look up, there's a certain extension that happens in your upper spine. And if that particular movement is really very unfamiliar or very uncomfortable, then it's like, it's like language, right? A language that has 26 letters in the alphabet, and maybe that extension of the upper thorax, that's it's like a, a consonant that you just haven't quite used in so long because of the nature of your work, maybe. But if you don't use it, you lose it. And, but, but more importantly than that, it's a matter of having like an equal amount of muscle tone on both sides of the spine. That's what keeps the, uh, the head resting over the spine, over the pelvis, so that you can move from your pelvis easily. So that you, yeah, I can see how, like when I explain it like this, it might actually sound so theoretically, theoretical, it's sort of hard to, to sense it. But what's interesting is that in, even in the horse world, they tend to say the pelvis is the engine. If you get the pelvis going, that's the most important thing. And then it creates a use of the, of the entire spine that then helps the horse support the weight of a rider. But that's a very different thing, of course, because they're in a different plane. They're in a horizontal plane instead of a vertical plane the way we are when we walk. So we didn't try the piece on the uh, So we did the thing where you were bring, moving the elbow and the knee together as a stick on the left side, right? But not on the right. So if you bring the right knee towards the left elbow and see if you can synchronize it so that it's as if there's this stick that's exactly one length. And see if you can be soft in your lips and your jaw and breathe. And then at some point, just go back to whatever's easier and smoother. It's harder, huh? It's easier and easier. So bend your knees and stand your feet, and just see if, um, if you can lift one knee, then the other up, and, and find a way to lift the knee over you so that you're, you're using more of yourself somehow. So that it, it looks, I mean, it looks lighter. Is it, is it in fact, a little bit easier than when, it, when you began? Do you feel more mobile? Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, just play with it until you feel like, okay, I feel it, I get it, I'm done, I'm good. And then let it go. And then, you know, I mean, how would you engage with this material so that it sticks? Like, this will stick for a little bit. You'll feel it maybe in the next 24 hours or the next day. But really, uh, it has something to do with how you use your pelvis when you lift your leg. So, and again, just to reiterate, like, the, what made me think of this lesson, I think, was driving and noticing that 
when I've done a little bit of this reorganization of my pelvis, it gets easier to lift my leg when I'm driving, but not only that, my pelvis moves too. Whereas when I'm sort of working too hard, sitting too long and tired, I, it feels like you know, there's a 10 pound weight on my leg when I just lift it to put it on the accelerator. So there's something wrong there, right? <laughs> Because there's really not that much driving going on here. This is a small, you know, nothing is more than 10, 15 minutes away. <laughs> so maybe just roll your head a little bit and see if it feels a little bit more comfortable to roll your head. And I hope that, you know, this little experiment with, you know, the use of the head and the eyes has has made it clear that somehow the eyes predominate. Like we're organized in such a way that if we see a predator, our, the muscles of the body will organize themselves around what the eyes see. It's just a survival thing. And so we can use that to reorganize you know, the, the tonus of the, the necks, the muscles in the neck. So as you're uh, doing resting with your arms and legs long, just do one last scan. And notice if something's different in the way that your back is engaged with the floor. Is it closer? Is it different somehow? There may be a different sensation in the front of the pelvis or in the front of the hip sockets. Somehow maybe it's just more connected, more open. Uh, the other thing that I thought was so interesting with this, this was an interview between a yogi and a neurologist who lives in Belgium. And um, and the yogi was really trying to get this neurologist to see that there's more to life than his equipment because he's really into measuring everything. So he said, well, so, so right now in this moment, what proof do you have that you're alive? Like, do you need to have proof for everything? Like, what's wrong with subjective experience? He was saying, like, isn't the fact that 10,000 people meditate and get themselves to experience a state of relative peace and calm and freedom, isn't that proof? That's subjective experience. 10,000 people who don't even know each other get the same results in their personal experience. Isn't that, doesn't that make subjective experience a valid thing? I don't think that the neurologist answered that question, really. It was more of a rhetorical thing. But, but when, when he said, you know, what proof do you have that you're alive or that we're alive? He said, well, you know, that's a very diff difficult question. We haven't quite answered that yet. Like, <laughs> at that point, I had to stop the tape and, and just laugh out loud um, because it just seemed so preposterous to think that, neurologically speaking, we have no proof that we're alive. <laughs> so when you're scanning your final scan, just appreciate that your subjective experience actually does matter. Notice if there's anything different about how your shoulders are contacting the floor. Because, you know, it's your life. You have to live in your body. Your body is your primary environment. And this is about learning to become more aware of our own comfort and our own groundedness and our own bodies and of you know, the people around us and the environment around us at the same time. So it's an expansion of focus. And just notice your breathing. Is it easier to breathe deeply, more fully? Is there any softening in the ribs? just makes it easier to move and easier to feel like you have more space inside your own body when your ribs are a little bit more mobile. And notice if your mind is perhaps more open, there's more silence, more space for being in a state that's not a state of thinking, but a state of You know, when we're really in the zone doing an, a sport, for example, skiing, or even hiking, you know, there's usually 
often a point at which we just get into this zone where time has no meaning and even space is, has a different quality. And we're not necessarily thinking in words. Maybe we're thinking in images, pictures, or memories. And so that all these different states of consciousness are just they're nice alternate ways to be so that we're not always stuck in a state of in one state. All right, and then when you're ready, slowly come to standing and just see if you can tool around the room for a few strides with the same level of attention and notice if there's any residual clarity about how you walk that you can sense when you're when you start walking after this lesson like or if as you walk could you exaggerate any piece of walking like this business about walking having three planes of motion Flexion and extension might not be so obvious, but if you exaggerate lifting your knee as you walk so that you can really feel your pelvis shifting position in the back, see if you could almost march as if you were intending to allow your lower back to get flat, your lower back to get long by the lifting of your foot so that you're kind of mimicking this thing you were doing on the floor where you take your head towards your knee and your knee towards your head as you lift so that can you feel your pelvis turning so that your tailbone comes underneath because for a lot of us when we sit a lot you know the lumbar spine gets really overused and short so it feels really bizarre to lengthen the low back Take your head towards your knee, too, when you do it, just to, just to check out the... It's like sometimes it's good to do it really small, but every now and then, sometimes if you exaggerate it, like, you know, Dr. Seuss or the Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks, then sometimes it's more self-evident. And then walk in a normal way and see if there's just, just greater freedom of motion. And with that, I'll sign off. And you can find details about Feldenkrais flow at yourlifematters.solutions. Hope to see you online sometime or in person. Bye.